The world without visas, Central America. All people can be divided into two groups. Some spend their entire lives where they were born, while others wander the world in search of the best places. Thousands of people over many centuries have left their homes and set off on a journey to discover new lands and continents. The study, Mastering and Enslavement of America, began with the Caribbean islands and accidentally brought the caravels of Columbus there. Then they moved a little further west and hit the continent in this area of Central America and Mexico. This area will be the purpose of the next stage of the project World Without Visa. In this route, I have included Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala and Mexico. Central American countries are not yet popular areas amongst Russian tourists, but the companions were still found. Oleg Semichev joined the trip first. With him, we have traveled around the world and around the world without visas and went to Nepal. Back on the road again. The second participant of the trip was Eugene Chermanov. He also knew me for a long time, I'll bet in absentia, on the books. The third person to join the trip was a pensioner from the city of Dolinsk in Sakhalin, Mainur Klementieva. How I smile! The fourth member of the trip was Sasha Perov from Voronezh. And of course, your obedient servant, Valery Shan. To travel around Central America is very dangerous. It is one of the regions of the world that is most populated with gangsters. Here, tourists are not only victims of pickpocketing, but are also robbed. The vast majority of bandits are armed with firearms and they do not hesitate to use them. But this region has so much to offer that it is worth the risk. The ruins of Mayan cities hiding in the deep jungle, active volcanoes, the white sandy beaches of the Caribbean Sea and the architectural gems of colonial Mexico and Guatemala. Our journey starts traveling with transfers. The first country on our way, Britain. We were allowed in without any problems. Say, welcome, come in, come in. Now we are looking for a hotel. In London we transit, sightseeing for only one night, and it would be a shame to waste it on sleep. Mexico. We flew to Mexico City in the dark of the night. The passport control at the airport Benito Juarez was surprisingly fast. We headed towards the nearest metro station. The center of Mexico City was very easy to reach. Just sit on the subway and for only nine of our Russian rubles, you reach the center of town and can freely walk around. On the way to Mexico, I strongly wanted to frighten my fellow passengers of the high criminal rate in Central America. I advised them not to leave their belongings unattended, to closely monitor the behavior of strangers approaching them, and that the group should be careful not to separate. I was thinking maybe I shouldn't intimidate my fellow traveler in such a way, but even the, but even the statistics for Latin America and the Caribbean speak for themselves. These areas contain only 8.5% of the world's population and account for 27% of the murders worldwide. Therefore, attentiveness and concentration on this journey was crucial. The bus to San Juan de Teotihuacan leaves from the North Bus Station. We found a place to set up our tents at the Franciscan Monastery's camping. We just made sure that our equipment was suitable for these climatic conditions. In the morning, we started walking towards the ruins of Teotihuacan. According to local inhabitants, the distance to cover should be between 3 and 4 kilometers. The farther we went, the more people were on the road. The now abandoned city of Teotihuacan, the city where men become gods, was founded in the beginning of our era. In its heyday, in the 2nd to 6th centuries, the city occupied an area of about 26 to 28 square kilometers. Then there were almost 100,000 people. The Aztecs inherited only the majestic ruins. The pyramids can still be seen, and we stumbled upon the tail of the queue. 
to the entrance still had about a kilometer, but we came to the very opening. What a line! Is this the queue to the pyramids? And what are you doing here? We got in the line, because look what it's like. Is this the queue to get sausages in some tent, or the one to the pyramids? We managed to get in Teotihuacan on March 21st, on the vernal equinox. That is when the center of the Sun in its motion along the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator and passes from the southern to the northern hemisphere. After spending the whole day wandering amongst the crowd under the bright rays of the sun, we went back to the campsite. In the morning we board the bus and went to Pachuca, a detour in Mexico City. In fact, we arrived in Mineral del Chico to visit and climb the mountains located near the city of Waterfall. We left the village, we continued our journey along a nasty serpentine road. I was glad that the road was deserted. Well... Badly. The day was summer warm, but with the onset of darkness it became rapidly colder. We found a great place for our tents surrounded by a dense forest. We each hiked our way back to the city aboard a large truck and we went to Pachuca. In any market in Latin America, you can find a tasty and cheap lunch in one of the mini canteens. This is how they prepare Mexican shawarma. Oleg ordered one. All ingredients? All. All of the ingredients. We then had to walk up the hill from the village of San Miguel del Milagro. Interestingly, the inhabitants of this village, who are not archaeologists, are the ones who opened the city of Cacaxtla. In September 1975, they were digging on top of a hill and accidentally stumbled upon a piece of ancient wall. It is a remarkably well-preserved fresco depicting the man-bird. After this discovery, scientists began archaeological excavations. I read that this temple and these ruins are strongly associated with the planet Venus. Their astrological calendar was bound to Venus. There are many symbols of the planets around this temple. The ruins of Kakakstla are perfectly visible from the nearby hill on which stood the ancient ceremonial center of Hoshitekat. Music plays Basta, California, Mexico, but we're not there. We are in Canscal and we danced with the volcano as our background. At the altitude of 2135 meters above sea level, surrounded by four volcanoes, Orizaba, Popocatépetl, Iztaccíhuatl and Malinche, is the city Puebla de Zaragoza although usually it is just called the Puebla, exactly the same as the entire state. Founded by the Spanish conquerors in 1530, the town is one of the earliest Spanish settlements in America. Almost the entire center of Puebla remained exactly the same as it was in colonial times. In Puebla, you can forget about time. Wandering through the main streets, we could visit one of the 99 churches. We suddenly stumbled upon a small museum. There is even a city of artists, workshops, galleries, cafes and an art market in houses inhabited only by artists. In every yard, the exhibition in each apartment, studio. On the streets everywhere, paintings, sculptures and art installations. What are your impressions of Puebla? It's a beautiful city, I like it. It is very creative and you can see artists every step of the way. So we spent the whole day in Puebla and only in the evening I realized that I was about to break one of my very important principles. 
that we should spend every night in a new place. Intercity buses leave from the new bus station located far from the center of the city. It turned out that we arrived just in time, as 15 minutes later was the departure of the bus to Campeche. Early in the morning we entered the territory of the Yucatan Peninsula from Campeche. It is the smallest of the three states of the peninsula and it is very wild. About 30% of its territory is still insufficiently explored. The main purpose of our trip to Central America was to visit places inhabited by the ancient Maya and today by their descendants. But at first we permanently stayed near Mexico City and only recently made it to the homeland of the Maya. In principle, the city of Campeche stands on the site of an ancient Mayan city, but there is literally not one stone left from this period. However, there are ancient ruins in the surrounding area. The biggest of them, the ruins of Edzna, is where we went next. The ruins of the ancient city of Edzna were found in 1907. As stated by archaeologists, the first settlers appeared there in the 7th century BC. But it was only in the 3rd century BC that a small Indian settlement became a real city. The majestic five-level pyramid, with a height of about 30 meters, is the largest building in the city. It is called a five-stories home. Farther down the Yucatan, we decided to go hitchhiking. On the Yucatan Peninsula, there were many ancient Mayan cities. Some of them have already been discovered, but even more still lurks in the dense jungle. Of course, we are not going to explore all the ancient cities. We first want to get acquainted with the most famous amongst them. In the next few days, we'll methodically move from ruins to ruins. On the way, Oleg complains. The buses in Central America are too expensive and I don't want to go over my budget. I will give you ten dollars for ten days of bus travel. We were in Uxmal just before the closing. The setting sun tinted the ruins in golden color. Mexican Indians knew that not all the places on earth have the same energy. And taking this opportunity, they did not found their city just anywhere, but in this very powerful place. Apparently, at one of these places was built Uxmal. We ended up looking for a place to set up the tents only once it got dark. The old Smolska pyramid is about half a mile from us, unfortunately. Come on, it's a maximum of 200 meters away. Some events are still held there, and if we suddenly wanted to spend the night there, we could get in trouble. We then decided not to go too far. Mainur was speechless. I was in shock. Early in the morning, in a way, we woke up when it was neither light or dark. It was as deserted on the highway as the forest was in the morning. The first truck appeared only during the fourth watch. We found a place for the five of us in the back, with planks and buckets of paint. Let's go! The pickup brought us to the town of Muna. It was founded by Mayan Indians before the advent of the Spaniard. There was a well with soft water. From here comes the name of the city. It is composed of two Mayan words, moon, meaning gentle or soft, and a, water. In the center of the city, filled with rickshaw streets, is a large square called the Central Square. There stands a colorful market and a huge Franciscan church. In the churchyard, we stopped only with the sole purpose, to photograph the church with the correct angle and distance. As we were about to leave, a priest appeared next to the church building, asking us, would you like to visit us in the convent? So we met with the abbot of the monastery, also part-time priest in the church, Father Alessandro. Father Alessandro volunteered to show us the courtyards and the empty cells of the monastery. He also spoke to us about the history of the monastery. We then went inside the church. Father Alessandro showed us what is attached to the wall wooden stairs. 
Since microphones did not exist, the priest rose to the pupil and preached there. The Christian, brothers and sisters, and then he suddenly started singing. We left by bus in the direction of Merida. We stopped a local bus, which travels intentionally 56 kilometers ahead. It became clear immediately after leaving the bus station that we were not just in a historical town, but in a tourist town as well. Izamal is also known as the city of three cultures. Its formation has contributed to the representatives of the ancient Mayan culture, the Spanish colonial period, and to modern Mexicans. The city was founded in the first millennium BC and successfully existed until the appearance of the Spaniards. Early in the morning, at the entrance of the ruins of Chichen Itza, was a huge crowd of tourists. In 2007, according to the results of a worldwide online survey about ruins of ancient cities, Chichen Itza was included in the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It was among the new seven wonders of the world. Visiting Chichen Itza is causing ambivalent feelings. On one hand, it is a large city with pyramids, temple and cenotes. On the other hand, the largest fair of Mexico. We stopped the truck. My companions jumped into the truck and I sat in the front to chat with a couple driving from Merida. I asked them to show us some inexpensive places to stay, but located right on the beachfront of the hotel. And we got exactly what we asked for. Shed a Shed is a wooden hut with attached roof but it has a veranda with an amazing sea view. We all slept wonderfully, like babies. The ancient Indian city of Chetumal existed long before the advent of the Spaniards. Punctually to the city of fall tropical typhoons, it was destroyed several times to the ground, so there are no buildings left. On the main street, there are several hotels and restaurants. In the heart of the city, near the market and the old bus station, was built the remarkably pompous building of the Museum of the Maya. Of course, we could not pass. Inside, however, everything was much more modest than outside. Several stone statues and blocks from the writings of the Maya, an ethnographic section and numerous models of the famous Mayan pyramids. The part we already saw. Indeed, such a museum could exist only on the rights of the only attraction. In addition to the museum, in the city of Chetumal, there is only the promenade that might attract a tourist. The promenade has got everything from loving couples, smugglers and rare tourists to non-conformists and just slackers. On the waterfront, across the old governor's palace was built a war memorial, and a little further right in the water, on an artificial mound, was mounted a statue of a fisherman with a net. According to archaeologists, the town of Xpujil was founded in the 5th century BC. Its heyday, the city has experienced during the classical period of the Maya, about 500-700 years of our era. Then began a period of stagnation and decay, and in the 12th century, the city was forever abandoned. The city is small when compared with such giants as Uxmal or Chichen Itza. Among the 17 excavated and restored buildings, the most notable is the temple of the three interconnected pyramids. Generally, the place is so rarely visited that, even in front of the entrance, there is not even a single patch with souvenirs. But if you visit the ruins, you can wander quietly all along. You will even be able to climb the ruins there. Of course, technically, climbing the ruins is prohibited, but it is easily doable as nobody reinforces this rule on this particular site. Highway 186 is causing amazing sensations. It seems like something is wrong. Beautiful, wide roads, recently covered with new asphalt, but surprisingly, it is all empty. We're in the vast Mexican highway. The asphalt is excellent, almost perfect everywhere. But the machines don't go there yet. 
And for whom did they try so hard to make these roads? The buses only run two to three times a day, and you can only see two to three cars per hour. The people in Mexico are mental, so hitchhiking here is very easy, even for us, being a group of five. Most backpackers visiting Palenque prefer to live outside the city, which is filled with many luxury hotels. They choose to stay in one of the simple guest houses or campsites, right in the jungle, on the way to the ruins. The ruins are in a wonderfully picturesque place, on a wide ledge, overgrown by dense jungle, hillside of the mountain range. The well-preserved ancient Mayan city ruins only further emphasize the natural beauty of the place. In Palenque, the first stage of our journey in Central America. From here we go further south, to Guatemala but not the full. I frequently reminded my traveling partners about bandits, possibly waiting for us in Central America. The effect of my reminder was unexpected for me. Oleg decided to stop his journey. I will gather my backpack and we'll go to Mexico City. And the four of us, me, Sasha Piero, Evgeny Shermanov and Minor Klemenkieva, will drive to the border of Guatemala the next morning. On the opposite side of the Mexican-Guatemalan border, we were waiting for the bus. How is Guatemala? Excellent. What stopped us? A punctured tire. It was not a touristic bus, but the most common local bus. However, in agreement with the travel agency, the bus didn't leave until we all got over the border. Guatemala is clearly poorer than Mexico, and it can be seen with the naked eye. Here, we arrived 25 minutes late. The wheel was punctured on the way. There is a reserve on the island that was built especially for tourists, service staff and security. Taking in consideration the high amount of crime in Guatemala, it is truly an island. We stayed at the hotel standing right on the lake shore. The view from the window, just the sunset, and the dawn will come across the ruins of Tikal. In Guatemala, Mexican money can be used. Now let's go to change them. By the way, I just changed 800 pesos and got 500 local rubles. It will be enough for tomorrow at Tikal and for the ride there and the bus to Rio Dolce. Tikal was one of the largest Mayan cities, the capital of the Mutoskop state. We drove up just before sunrise at the entrance to Tikal. However, the rising sun could not be seen. The ruins were shrouded in thick morning fog. The slopes of the pyramids of Tikal are steeper than the pyramids of the Maya in the Yucatan, but they are still accessible to tourists. They build special wooden stairs for easy climbing. It's amazing how the ancient Mayans could ascend the steep stone steps. Such high pyramids apparently were not only temples, but also impregnable fortresses. From the bus station in Santa Elena, we drove to Rio Dolce on the decommission U.S. school bus. These buses are still in Guatemala, a significant portion of the fleet. We arrived late at night in the town of Rio Dolce. We went on foot to the hotel for backpackers. The huge wooden barrack, similar to a soldier's barrack, full of bunk beds, was placed at our complete disposal. You can catch a boat to Livingston from Rio Dolce twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon. A trip on this boat has a two-in-one value, the passage and the excursion on the river. On the way to the Caribbean Sea, our boat stopped in all touristic places. The houses built on stilts, the hot springs, coming directly into the bath and separated from the river by a stone fence, and of course, the restaurant, designed for tourists. According to the map, Livingston is located on the mainland, but I live here on the island. The road is still there. The mainland from here is only accessible by water, river or sea. 
a lifetime dream. Now I only need to buy a sailboat and a property here. Two square meters will do fine. Now we're in Guatemala, here on this side. This virtual line separates us from this country, so famous in Russia. According to the movie The Diamond Arm, we know better Kolyma in Honduras than Rasit on Kolyma. It's Honduras, and we come here without visas. Super! We go by foot to the Guatemalan-Honduran border. Honduran visa is acquired directly at the border. Immediately after the Honduran border post, we are waiting for the bus to the town of Copano Ruinas, which is just 10 km away from the border. The bus drops off passengers in Copano Ruinas at a small bus station near the market next to the central square. Seven out of ten Honduran families live below the poverty line. Chronic unemployment and general politic instability are the basis for the majority of crimes committed here. According to official data, about a quarter of Hondurans at least once in their life have been victims of robbery, theft or violence. It is clear that tourists are not particularly eager to go here. Evgeny says that this is not real, and I completely agree with him. The town of Copan Ruinas is only about a kilometer distance to where the Copan ruins are. Copan is often called the Athens of the ancient Maya. Here the central part of the city is also located on a hill. In a Greek manner, is called the Acropolis. In the immediate vicinity were numerous pyramids and temples, a playground for ball games and houses of the local nobility. After passing through the entrance gate, we were first on a large area. The less you see of large cities in Central America, the better will be the impression of the region. All big cities in the region suffer from overcrowding, crime, and a complete absence of historical attractions. My last night in Honduras was spent in Comayagua, what is the name of this city? Comayagua is the former capital of Honduras, 100 or 200 years ago, I think. Early in the morning, at the crack of dawn, we walked to the highway to catch a passing bus to Tegucigalpa. The major cities in Central America are dirty, noisy and dangerous. To overtake them is very difficult. Moreover, for the convenience of the bandits, there is no single bus terminal. The bus comes to any market in one gang area and goes to the other. Honduras cannot be attributed as a super-developed country of the world, but judging by the border crossing we just passed, it seems like Nicaragua will be even poorer. We entered Nicaragua without a visa as well. After Nicaragua received its independence, two parties continuously fought for power in the country, the Liberal and the Conservative parties. Historically, the main base of the Liberals was Lyon, a commercial city inhabited by the bourgeoisie and the Conservatives of Granada, the center of the large landowners and Conservative Catholic priests. In Lyon, the group got separated. Sasha Perot decided to go for a week in San Juan del Sur on the Pacific Ocean to learn how to surf. Others preferred to travel around the country. So in the morning, Sasha went to the ocean while we were in Granada. In Granada, the bus did not come to the bus station, as the bus station simply did not exist. Instead, the bus came in a courtyard. Luckily, the city was not far, so we walked. During the colonial period, the city, located on the crossroads of trade routes between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, Lake Nicaragua and the River San Juan, 
was very actively developed. But because of this, it was often attacked by pirates and bandits, especially in periods of instability during the wars and revolutions. The bus took us to the bus station in Rivas. This town usually is only a transit stop on the way to the islands of Lake Nicaragua or Costa Rica. Ferries depart almost continuously from Rivas to Ometepe Island. As soon as one is loaded and departs, it is replaced by another in a hurry. So the waiting period was very short. We took a ferry to the largest lake island on the largest lake of Central America. The ferries from San Jorge in Moyogalpa carry only the locals and a handful of tourists. Moyogalpa is one of the two largest cities on the island Ometepe. There are all the tourists, simply because the city is the landing place of the ferry. The main attraction that is advertised in all the local tour companies is an active volcano named Concepcion. We did not dare to climb the Concepcion volcano on our own. We used the services of a tour company and hired a guide, who safely accompanied us to the top. We started early in the morning and the three of us were joined by three more, an American tourist and a few British tourists. We turned off-road next to the signpost for the national park. Initially, the trail passed by farms. Then the trail gradually became steeper and steeper. The steps were made out of the roots of trees, pillar, trunks. Sometimes we waded through the small gullies, eroded by rain, and we had to look down at all times. After passing through thick bushes, above us towered the cone of the volcano, on which even grass does not grow, as its surface is covered by volcanic hash. In addition to strong winds and the strongest smell of sulfur, a clear sign of volcanic activity, our guide decided that in such circumstances, reaching the top of the volcano was too dangerous, and he would not take us there. Of course, it's not good to turn halfway, but sometimes we have to. Here's your hat. Yes. The next morning we continued to move in the direction of the Madieras volcano. As it usually happens in hitchhiking, by chance we arrived in an unheard place, because there was a pickup truck that we stopped. On a small river, a dam was built and it created a pond with a strong and mysterious name, Eyes of the Water. Despite the fact that Ometepe Island is surrounded by Lake Nicaragua, people are eager to swim in the pond. And we soon realized why. A surprisingly clean running water at a perfect temperature a huge difference from the warm but dirty from the sand and clay water of the lake, on top of intrusive waves. We stopped by eyes of the water solely out of curiosity, simply because we got here by accident, but ended up stuck there for a couple of hours. It was so enjoyable that we did not want to leave. Apparently, it really is a mystical place and we only wanted to stay there longer. After swimming in cold water, it was even nicer to walk. Especially as the road surprisingly reminded me of a pedestrian street. There are practically no cars here, and the street itself is made of tiles instead of asphalt. So on the sidewalk we came to San Rafael. This holiday village with a sandy beach on the lake is considered the premier beach resort of the island. It is this endeavor that brings so many tourists to Ometepe Island. Many of the tourists want to stay even more, especially now, in pre-Easter week. We were lucky. We took the last three bungalows and then saw several times in the hotel people coming and leaving in disappointment as no free rooms were available.
For Metepe Island attracts tourists and gives them the opportunity to walk on the roads without the fear of ending up under the wheels of a truck or swallowing exhaust fumes. On both sides of the road stretches banana plantations. No wonder that Nicaragua is one of the classic banana republics. To the left is the volcano Madeira, and on the right the volcano Concepcion. Then we crossed the island by a narrow isthmus. We arrived by bus in San Ramon. We were hoping to leave the next day, also by bus. But the buses only leave every other day. We were just very lucky. The people are not sitting at the back of the truck. So is the conductor who collects the fees. It is nicer to travel using the open truck than using the jam-packed bus. And they are almost always packed to the brim with people and goods. The truck arrived at the ferry dock in Moyogalpa and started to board people for the next run. We hurried onto the ferry and had to jump at the last moment. Located on the Pacific coast town of San Juan del Sur was a very important port. During the gold rush in California, this port was the arrival point of the ships of the American Wild West. Here they were unloaded and the goods were transported by land to Granada. After the opening of the Panama Canal, shipping through Nicaragua became unprofitable and the port of San Juan del Sur quickly lost its importance. Only in recent years it has been revived as a resort village. In San Juan del Sur we were in the midst of Easter celebration. It was Good Friday. On the promenade was a long procession with the crucifix and the traditional Catholic country's costume parade. People walked barefoot wearing blue and purple robes with religious icons and wooden crosses to remind ourselves and others about the suffering of the Christ on the way to Calvary. But the people who filled the streets of San Juan del Sur did not come for the parade. They came to enjoy the beach. For them, Easter is a wonderful opportunity to go to the sea. Because of the influx of tourists, the local hotels increased their prices drastically, sometimes being double or triple the normal price. Yes, during those times, finding a place to stay can be quite challenging. On the beach Hermosa, in 2010, was filmed the 21st season of the popular US reality show Survivor. There, we put our tent right on the ocean line. The ocean will never be confused with the sea. Majestic, powerful waves with great force rolled on the shore. This part of the Pacific attracts mostly surfers, as the waves are perfect for surfing. Sasha Pierov spent a whole week learning how to stand on the board, but did not fully succeed riding yet. He will have to practice and practice. I returned my board. It's funny. I don't know what to do and what will happen next. It turns out I was surfing with my wallet. 70 local Cordobas is not a lot, but I hope the credit card will work. Okay, I will drive now. By the evening, most of the visitors had left the beach and we stayed there almost alone. In fact, there was five guards with us. Of course, they didn't only protect us, but an unfinished hotel as well. They strongly reminded us, do not go far down the beach. It's safe for a while, but then you can run into trouble. It's good they did not mind us making a fire. So we spent the night on the Pacific Ocean, in a wild and dangerous place, with a bonfire before the tent and the guards around. 
и охранниками вокруг. How is Nicaragua? Nicaragua, it is a lovely country. I will personally remember surfing the most. This is better than Mexico. It is a beach on the Pacific Ocean. Nice place, the best for me. Therefore, Nicaragua is the best country so far in the journey. It might even be better than El Salvador, but I doubt it. All the capitals of Central American countries compete with each other for the crime rate. Among them, there are more or less no safe cities. They are hazardous and very dangerous. Which of them is the most dangerous, it's hard to say. Well, Sasha, where did this happen to you? In the Apop. The city is called the Apop. In El Salvador, without a popa, you cannot go anywhere. It was half past midnight at a gas station. They said they would kill us. <laughs> the ruins of San Andreas are located just 20 kilometers from the capital. After 20 meters left, we camped right on the trail between the fence and the field. How was the first night in El Salvador? A great night. I loved it. It was not possible for us to see the ruins of San Andreas this time. They are closed on Mondays. But we still got soaked by ancient vibrations. We slept directly on the territory of the ancient city. It's a shame I don't know Spanish. I would try to bribe him. Please. We arrived in the city of Santa Ana. The Livingston Hotel drew a familiar name. Two stories buildings connected by the letter G, offering simple standard rooms. From Santa Ana, we took the bus to the town of Chalchuapa, 15 miles away, one of the oldest cities in the country. The remaining ruins of the city of Chalchuapa, a city that existed in the period between the late 1st century to the beginning of the 8th century, and its prosperity survived in the classical period of the Maya in 3rd to the 8th centuries. The Yopango volcano is located 75 kilometers east of Chalchuapa. The ashes that ensured the fertility of the soil and high yields was the reason for the destruction of the city. The city died suddenly, like the Italian Pompeii, it was covered with layer of ashes. On a steep mountain road, we reached the town of Concepcion de Ataco by minibus less than 10 kilometers away. El Salvador is the smallest country in Central America, but crossing it quickly from end to end is impossible, due to the fact that most of the territory is occupied by mountains. Salvadorans joke, if our country had a good iron, it would be so much bigger. Which town is this? Apaneca, the city of Apaneca. Before that, we were in Ataco. They are almost identical. Guatemala. Antigua is the old capital of the country. Not desiring going to the new capital, Guatemala City, we took another connecting route. In Antigua, you can enjoy walking many days. The city is not very large, but very rich in attractions. Almost all the old buildings that have been restored are used to serve tourists. In the old mansions and palaces are the Spanish schools, hotels, restaurants and travel agencies. There are more tourists here than in any other city in Central America, and the atmosphere is kind of elevated and festive. Guatemala is one of those rare places on earth where people are afraid to be photographed. 
Photographers are often beaten. Already a few tourists with cameras were killed due to the fact that they tried to photograph children without their parents' permission. But you still would not be allowed. I was in the market taking hidden pictures, holding the camera next to my hip without aiming, avoiding to hold the camera in front of my face. Yet some have still noticed that they are photographed and started to throw tomatoes, dried fish and barley at me. We took the next bus from Sololi to Panajashel, the tourist capital of Lake Atitlan. Boats to San Pedro La Laguna leave from the waterfront. The captains of these boats agreed to establish a fixed price for travel. We waited for an hour before the captain gave up and sailed away with a half-empty boat. The main local attraction, the San Pedro Volcano, has a height of 3,020 meters. The ascent is fairly easy as the path is trodden down, but it is better to hire a local guide in Guatemala, not so much to show the way as to protect us from local bandits. We will need to hike for three or four hours a three kilometer distance. I have a gut feeling we never should have agreed to this adventure, but reading the 12 chairs did not go in vain. A gamble is a gamble. The more adventures, the more fun. In the meantime, we are watching the Real Madrid football. Yevgeny chose to stay in the village, and the three of us found the agency office where we registered for the hike. We were assigned a guide, and together with him, we drove to the ascension point by taxi. The ascent was much harder than we expected. Maino gave up in the first third of the ascent and stayed waiting for us in the gazebo, with views of San Pedro. Another hour and a half to go. Finally, it is for you, boys. I'm here. We thought so. Not that we will be waiting, but that you might feel bad there. Sasha and myself managed to do it in the given time, but literally at the last effort, and sweating like a plowing horse. But as it turns out, we didn't need to hurry. When we arrived to the top, it was shrouded in thick clouds. Neither the lake nor the neighboring volcanoes could be seen, and even the crater could hardly be seen. However, it was overgrown with such a dense forest that even in bright sunlight only the treetops could be seen. Are you carving Vasya was here? Is this what it reads? The Russians will immediately see it. On the way back, we caught up with Mainur, who was slowly walking down. She didn't miss much. On the top was only a dense forest and clouds, and lower, clear visibility and great views of the village of San Pedro and its lagoon. We decided to walk down, but we were very tired, so we gladly accepted the offer to ride on a tuk-tuk. It turns out that these three-wheeled scooters, even if they can normally accommodate one to two passengers, can actually fit four. The safest way to move from one coastal village to another is by the lake, on motorboats and boats. In San Pedro, there are two docks. We arrived at the eastern dock, sailing from Panajachel, and had to leave from the western pier, located on the opposite side of the rocky island. When we got to the pier for loading, the boat was already full with passengers. Even locals do not risk to go by the road. But we luckily found a place on the roof, next to a carpet cellar. We are sailing on the roof of this fragile little craft. It is okay if I don't move too much, but feels like it is ready to topple over when I move. So we sail and enjoy the process. 
We arrived on Sunday in Santiago de Atitlan. When our boat moored, a religious ceremony was held in the marina. Christians evangelists were baptizing new members by immersion. Young girls and boys wearing clothes went to the lake about chest deep and waited for their turn. Then, one by one, they were approaching the three missionary men who were controlling the process of immersion in the water. Not just squatting, but dipping their heads leading back. Concurrently, one of the parishioners was reading psalms on the shore. Around him gathered a dense crowd, mainly of women and children. They were all dressed in their national costumes. National traditions were tenacious not only in clothing but also in religion. When local Indians are becoming Catholic, they are in no hurry to abandon their cults. The syncretic sect of Lake Stumbo appeared in Santiago. Their doctrine is a complex mixture of medieval Catholicism of the 16th century, brought by the Spaniards and the pagan cults of the ancient Maya. The members of the sect display doll idols in the church. They don't only pray to them, as customary among Christians, they also bring fruits and flowers, as the pagans used to do. But mostly, instead of fruits and flowers, local people bring things that they think are valuable – beer, vodka, tobacco or money. The journey is coming to an end. We return to Guatemala City. These are the last scenes. At the bus station in Guatemala City, we were attacked by three bandits with guns. Even shooting was involved. Fortunately, we all have survived, but after that, we could not film anymore. And the completion of the journey, return to Mexico City and from there back to Russia, that we failed to film.